Thank you, Tim. Um, that was a very nice introduction. A representation, a representation of everything is not quite ready, but we are working on it. And to do that, or anything like that, you have to work with people who know things that you aren't trained with. And that is what brings me to my topic. Um, well, in Turkish, we have the saying, uh, it's an idiom, be, it, monkey appetite. Uh, a monkey appetite is used when a person can't stop themselves from exploring, opening every door, turning every stone, uh, tasting every flavor, and maybe wanting to hear every sound that is out there. This is often said lovingly, but in a critical way. We don't necessarily think monkeys doing it right. But I'm here to defend the monkey, and I think I'm in good company because I think monkeys at home actually listening to TED Talks all day. Now, I started off uh, studying cartography, uh, geometics to be more precise, in a civil engineering faculty. I wanted to learn about maps because maps are fascinating and I don't think I have to work very hard to convince you after today's speakers showing you how great maps are and how people take it personally, how they use maps to tell stories, not only just to find their ways. This particular piece you're looking at is a map from 1513, and this person who made the map has never left Mediterranean Sea, yet actually mapped the, coasts, the coast of Americas. He did that by talking to other sailors. That was particularly fascinating for me, because if you actually look further into this map, you also find here be dragons, here be half-man, half-monster creatures. So I learned about maps. I learned a lot of math about maps. Maps are very, very geometric uh, if you go into the engineering side of it. If you go to the geography side of it, then it gets into more into an interface where you can tell a lot of stories. But maps are also three-dimensional because the Earth is three-dimensional. Obviously, a lot of the math that is involved in making maps is trying to make something three-dimensional into two-dimensional, but it's possible to actually run into such visualizations. Here you see two images that are superimposed. Like in the cinema, actually there's a red and blue filter. If you were wearing glasses, the mountains would be coming at you, but I didn't have 400 blue and red glasses to bring for you. So I ran into this, and then that got me fascinated, because the mountain, uh, it was a picture of a mountain, a real picture of a mountain, it was staring at me. And it was actually fascinating because it made me ask, why do we have two eyes? The geography community uses this in a discipline called photogrammetry to drive 3D coordinates and to create virtual reality representations because this is immersive, this is closer to the reality, it's not as abstract as two-dimensional maps. But the question, why do we have two eyes, because this is a stereoscopic visualization, brought me yet into other disciplines than what I was trained for. I, I started reading about vision science and biology and optics and neuroscience. I learned a lot of interesting things, such as, for example, predators actually have um, their eyes in front and prey have their eyes on the sides. Predators, therefore, perceive that a little bit better because they chase and forward vision is very important for them. Prey, on the other hand, has their field of vision a little bit larger, which allows them to see motion better because peripheral vision is more sensitive to detecting motion. This knowledge wouldn't come to me unless I actually went out of my comfort zone, my own educational formation and discover what other people were talking about, what other co-scientists were talking about. Well, vision is very interesting, which leads to perception, optics, and computer vision. Uh, vision is very interesting because it's our strongest sense. In fact, neuroscientists would say 40% of the brain is busy processing visual input. And part of the way the visual input comes into your eye is into a ret on your retina in a small yellow spot called fovea. And on the fovea, the photoreceptors are organized in a way that in the center, you actually perceive very, very high resolution. These are called cones, a certain type of photoreceptor, and they capture the light longer. They stay open, it's quite fascinating, and then they close. And the rods are more uh, on the peripheral vision, which is more sensitive to motion, which you can link to uh, the prey and predator story. But for geographers, the problem is 
related, or I could see that there's a problem that I could relate to, is that geographic data is typically very, very large. We collect immense amounts of data using la lasers and remote sensing and GPS and ground surveys. But we need to, we are very busy, cartographers have always been very busy to try to reduce the level of detail, reduce what is not relevant. So I wondered if we actually know where people are looking, can we reduce what they don't actually perceive? Because if, if you perceive very, very precisely in the center, can you remove the information in the periphery that's blurred? When I look at my hand, I can still see you, but you are blurred. So can I blur the rest of the image that I don't actually need to render? And this is uh, relevant. I, uh, this is done in uh, image and video processing. Um, I took it to the stereoscopic visualization. And in fact, you can gain a lot of um, computational processing power by doing that, you can remove 96% of the detail if you know where a person is looking in 3D space. Um, in one example, it changes a little bit, and I'm not going to give you the full detail. You can come to me afterwards. So this is called foveation uh, in video Im image processing community, and I, I did this stereoscopic foveation. And the word gaze contingent displaced that appears in the slide there is, is it refers to knowing where people are looking. So you have an eye tracking. Um, module that is attached to the display, you know where a per person is looking and you render the display based on this knowledge. But dealing with eye tracking, or, well, I now came to do with something to do with eye tracking, also brought me to yet another discipline. That is because eye tracking is quite popular in user experience community. It shows where people attend. Not only that you can do a gaze contingent display, but you can also tell where do they look? How long do they look? How often do they look? In which sequence they actually execute a task? That was yet another discipline that I found myself involved and I started to run user studies when I actually thought, um, okay, this is an innovative geographic visualization paradigm. How do I test it? Well, why don't I use eye tracking to test this with usability? And in fact, you end up with a lot of data when you track people's eyes very quickly. Um, so. With my colleagues, we actually wanted to try whether we could use a sequence analysis, and that brought me to yet another uh, discipline where people actually use DNA sequencing. So we borrowed this method. I'm not the first one, I'm not the only one. We borrowed this method and applied to our user experience study and could demonstrate that people who have um, longer experience with maps perform better because their sequences group together. This is what you see here. Now, after the eye tracking um, and user experience studies, we also arrived at yet another discipline, which is related. All of this is related, called um, visual analytics. Visual analytics is concerned how people reason with interactive interfaces. So in this example, you see the slowest person who solves a task using the exact same interface uses 521 seconds, and the fastest person uses 11 seconds. The difference, this individual difference, or this group differences, are very important for us to identify so that we can actually make better or more effective maps. Why do you care to make better or more effective maps? Now, I'll bring you back to biology just a little bit and show you a very old map that was actually to do with life and death. This is called... Um, snow map or ghost map as it's known, and it's to do with the cholera outbreak. People believe that cholera actually was spreading through the air, but one particular medical doctor decided to make a map, and he started to put dots, and eventually he could see a pattern, and he could identify that it actually came from a certain water pipe, which is marked there. This actually led to discovery of um, the fact that cholera did not come from air, but it was by water. So with this, I'm going to conclude and say that interdisciplinary science is good, crossing boundaries is good, leaving your comfort zone, reading about things that you don't know and you're not trained for is good. You can actually lead to uh, unexpected discoveries. And the monkey should be allowed to do that because monkey can potentially come up with new recipes that we didn't think. They should be encouraged to have this appetite. Thank you for your attention.